Coming up on Market to Market, Obama tries to break through a 55-year barrier in the name of trade. And the dairy industry adapts to life under a new subsidy program. Those stories and market analysis with Don Rose, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, March 25 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. U.S. homebuyers realized the American dream by purchasing new homes last month. The transactions injected much-needed cash into the recovering U.S. economy. According to the Commerce Department, new home sales rose 2% last month, slightly behind a year ago. However, data from the National Association of Realtors shows existing home sales fell 7.1% in February. And the Commerce Department reported orders for durable goods declined 2.8% last month. When big-ticket items like airplanes are removed, the economic indicator fell 1%. As part of helping the U.S. economy recover, several groups from Main Street to Washington, D.C. are working to find new markets for American products. This week, President Obama took up the cause and became the first president in 90 years to travel the short 90 miles to Cuba to open a door closed for more than five decades. Angry expats who escaped the 1959 revolution took exception to the trip. They were joined by other critics who cited the country's poor human rights record. The president's Cuban trip included a meeting with Fidel Castro's brother Raul, a baseball game, and dancing the tango at a state dinner, reinforcing the old adage that it takes two to tango on trade. Peter Tubbs reports. President Obama became the first U.S. president since Calvin Coolidge to visit Cuba this week. The visit was an extension of Obama's program to normalize relations between the U.S. and the communist nation, reversing over 50 years of government policy. Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro had decades of Cold War issues to discuss, among them Cuba's emerging privately owned economy, human rights, and the American military presence at Guantanamo Bay. The president called the economic embargo of Cuba a relic of the past. I will keep saying it every chance I get. One of the best ways to help the Cuban people succeed and improve their lives would be for the U.S. Congress to lift the embargo once and for all. The embargo has also been costly to the United States, reducing trade of finished goods by over a billion dollars per year, according to some estimates. However, agricultural products have had a special exemption from the embargo since 2002. The U.S. has been shipping over $500 million of everything from grains to seafood to boxed beef annually, making the United States Cuba's largest supplier of food products. Even with a population of only 11 million, Cuba must import 70 to 80 percent of its food. The president acknowledged that Cuba has made progress in modernizing its economy. To its credit, the Cuban government has adopted some reforms. Cuba is welcoming more foreign investment. Cubans can now buy and sell property, and today many Cubans own their own homes and apartments. It's easier for Cubans to travel, to buy a cell phone, for farmers to start cooperatives, and for a family to start their own business. But critics of Obama's efforts cite a lack of change in Cuba as a reason to continue the embargo. President Obama says that human rights are important to him, but empty words with no actions to back them up sends the message to the Castro regime to continue with his repression. And Castro continues to do so. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack joined the president on the tour to sign agreements to share research data, as well as coordinating the opening of Cuban markets to American companies. Several agricultural and commodity trade groups support the move, including the American Soybean Association. Today's announcement is a big step forward in terms of expanding the Cuban marketplace for U.S. soy. That's why ASA, as the policy organization of the soybean family, 
maintains a policy position in favor of removing the Cuban embargo entirely. No matter the final outcome of any trade negotiations, Congress will have the last word on whether or not the embargo on the tiny island nation will be lifted anytime soon. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Among those searching for new markets are U.S. dairy farmers. According to the National Milk Producers Federation, the U.S. herd yields 30 billion pounds of milk over and above what U.S. consumers can drink annually. The ever-increasing amount of product has the potential to depress prices. Under previous farm bills, dairy producers were nearly guaranteed automatic subsidy payments in lean times. That was until 2014 when the new Farm Bill introduced policies to wean producers off of government payments. Colleen bradford Krantz explains. In 2009, dairies like Iowa-based Yarrabee Farms were losing as much as $500 per cow. Subsidies paid through the government's former dairy program, Milk Income Loss Contract, helped many farms survive the year. Most years, 100% of eligible dairy farms would receive a payment of some kind. As of 2015, however, a new program, the Margin Protection Program, was in place. And new data shows how dramatic the shift has been. Just 1%, or about 250 of the nearly 25,000 U.S. dairy farms enrolled in MPP in 2015, received anything back from the government's insurance-style program. The days of the government giving us money to milk cows is over. 54% of the nation's nearly 44,000 licensed dairy farms did enroll in MPP for 2016, the program's second year. However, farmers are required to continue in the program through at least 2018 once they've enrolled. And the percentage of dairy farms choosing to pay premiums for the margin protection program's higher levels of coverage has dropped significantly from 56% in 2015 to 22% in 2016. I think people thought, okay, well, uh, for the first time in 40 years, the government hasn't sent me a check in the fall, so maybe we just shouldn't partake in this program. Most instead paid only a $100 administrative fee for a minimal so-called catastrophic protection. MPP provides financial assistance to farmers only when the difference between the price of milk and the price of feed falls below a certain dollar amount. Enrolled dairy farmers are automatically covered at a minimum $4 margin, which is considered a catastrophic loss level. Producers can choose to pay higher premiums to protect a greater percentage of their income. In 2015, milk prices slid downward, but feed prices also declined canceling out any advantage the program might have provided for the majority of producers. Our experience in the first year of it was such that people who bought up coverage, paid a little bit of premium for buy-up coverage, um, found that didn't, they didn't hit those levels of margin. And so what we saw this year uh, for 2016 is a similar level of involvement, participation in the program, but more people are in it at the basic catastrophic coverage level. According to USDA, dairy producers pay the government nearly $73 million in MPP fees and premiums last year, while only $685,000 was paid out. That's a glass half full, half empty story. You don't want it to drop to the level that you're going to collect payments because that means that you lost money on a lot of the milk you produced. Some industry leaders point out that the program should not be judged in a one-year period. Others, like Dane Lang, suspect many milk producers are finding other strategies for weathering potential price shifts after receiving little or nothing from the program last year. Lang, a fourth-generation dairy producer, said he enrolled at a premium margin level of $6.50 in 2015. This year, Yarrabee Farms chose to instead use forward contracting through its dairy cooperative to manage risk. This year, we participated in the government program so that our production records are in the program and we can stay in the program, but we were able to purchase what we think of as a much better margin and a much better value to us through the market. 
Lang says some dairy farms produce too little milk to enter into most private sector contracts. You can't go in and say, I want to sell 100 pounds of milk on a contract. Nobody does that. You have to be able to sell, at least with our cooperative, contracts are made in 200,000 pound increments. For those smaller dairies, MPP may provide the only option for help during the most difficult years. Lang also believes programs like MPP force farmers to balance their books with less help from the government and might shorten tough times in the dairy industry. I think people have to make quicker decisions now and they have to make more realistic decisions because that government handout's not there anymore. And I think in 2009, if the government program had been such as it is now, maybe it would have been a six month crash in milk price rather than a 12 month uh, disaster. If MPP had been in place between 2009 and 2014, government officials calculated it would have paid out more than it took in during three of the six years. In order to determine payments to producers, the program incorporates national numbers for feed and milk prices. As a result, dairy farms in Midwestern or other states that produce large amounts of corn, soybeans, and alfalfa have a financial advantage over states like California, where feed is more likely to be shipped in from greater distances. I will agree that having a national index, which is what you have to have in a program like this, does have different impacts in different parts of the country. Mulhern says the government's feed prices offered a reliable starting point, but farmers need that cost estimate only to run their own calculations on what level of government-run coverage, if any, is most logical. Although fewer dairy farms dot the countryside than in past decades, those still operating continue to hit record levels of production. In 2015, all U.S. dairies produced 209 billion pounds of milk, up 1.3% from the year before. Mulhern says that with large supplies, the next battle plan should focus on increasing exports to prevent prices from sliding. Dairy industry exports have grown from less than $1 billion in 2000 to a record $7.2 billion in 2014, before dropping again in 2015 to $5.3 billion. As the margin protection program matures, dairy farmers will continue to watch, waiting to see if any advantage emerges or if more farmers shy away from the government's insurance-style program. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. The commodity markets closed early this week due to Good Friday and Easter celebrations. Even with fewer trading sessions, South American political unrest, and foreign import reductions, the grain markets finished relatively flat. For the holiday shortened week, the May wheat contract was unchanged, while the nearby corn contract moved only three cents higher. A brief rally for soybeans burned itself out, but it didn't prevent the May contract from finishing 13 cents higher. May meal stayed with the trend, rising $8.50 per ton. In the SOTS, the May cotton contract rose $0.56 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, April Class three milk futures lost $0.16. Cents. In the livestock sector, the April cattle contract fell $3.97, April feeders were off $6.37, and the April lean hog contract declined $1.82. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index rose 105 points this week. The May crude oil contract rose a scant two cents per barrel. COMEX gold dropped 32.70 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost just over seven points to settle at 327.95. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Don Rose. Don, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. We had a relatively uneventful week in the wheat markets. Finished the week unchanged. Where do you think that sets us up as we look into this next week? Well, exactly. You know, the wheat market started out the week with uh, a little bit of fireworks. We did have some freeze damage in the uh, hard red winter wheat area. The trade's still trying to assess what the damage was. Realistically, it's probably somewhere in that 10 to uh, 30 million bushels, so really not enough to make the difference. But, um, you know, the market was anchored back to near unchanged again throughout the week just because the big world supplies that we have push us back down. When we're under 8% of the total world market share, it's just not enough to make a, a big move to the upside unless the rest of the world follows us. So that's right where we're at. Now, as you look ahead to next week's USDA stocks and uh, planting estimates, any chance there we could get some numbers that would move this wheat market? 
Well, it's possible, but I think when you look at it, uh, estimates are somewhere down three million on the wheat acres just because of the profitability versus a year ago. Um, but when you look over to the stocks number that we have as of March 1st, actually the numbers were probably about 200 million over a year ago. Then when you look at the world numbers on ending stocks, we're about 1.2 billion bushels more than we were two years ago. So just a lot of wheat in the world market. And you know that's an issue for the corn market also because now there's feed wheat that is out here particularly in Europe, competing with corn. Now, as you mentioned, this corn market, as we look out here, there's still a lot of growers sitting with old crop corn in the bin. We've had a little bit of a rally here, old crop corn. How do you handle that? Well, I think where you're really sitting with the uh, corn market, there's just too much corn also. But you have two moving parts that could push you to the upside. If the dollar would happen to come under pressure, it did, uh, you know, a few days back, and it did give us a boost to the market. Then if we get into some weather issues, that could be another issue. And by the way, we do have the delta in the southeast getting to be a concern, too wet. Probably aren't going to get all the acres planted there. The forecast here uh, on uh, over the weekend uh, looks like we're going to be uh, wet and cool again. So, you know, that's starting to be a little bit of an issue along with our weather here in the U.S. is starting to really uh, well, look real favorable, not so much as it was once. But your real question is, what do you do with sales? I think with the funds sitting with a big short position, probably uh, 10 cent rallies, uh, 5 to 15 cent maybe, are uh, a catch up sales opportunity in the corn. Okay. Now, you touch on weather as we look out, as you mentioned, in the Delta, in Texas massive amounts of rain have fallen over the past month. We've got a question here from Adam in Woden, Iowa uh, on Twitter. We encourage all of you to send us questions on our social media. Adam is wondering with carryout levels where they are, you mentioned this massive global supply of corn. What is a realistic weather premium for new crop corn? Well, let's look at it. what happened last year. We had some massive wet weather problems. We had carryouts that were uh, lower than what we have this year. You rallied corn to 454 and it stalled, 454 and a half and installed. So what kind of weather premium should we put in the market? I always tell people this time of year, we're sitting at 387 on D's corn roughly. We usually have this time of year about 60, 70%, 70 cents uh, risk premium in the market. So right now, you're trading uh, probably uh, around the 320 uh, futures market on corn. Um, what kind of premium could we put in the market? going to be hard for corn to get over $4 without some real serious problems as we go forward. But you do have a catalyst, and that's the fund sitting with a big short position just ahead of the start of the growing season. So with that record short fund position and the idea that there's really probably not a whole lot of premium that we can pour into this thing, how aggressive are you on new crop sales if and when we should get a weather rally? Well, I think you have to be real aggressive because our downside target uh, this next fall, if we, you know, if we get the acres that we think, and we'll find out on uh, the report. And what March are you 31st, thinking acreage-wise? We're thinking that the acres probably going to be up two and a half million on the corn. Okay. Um, you know, last year we're 88 million. We think it'll be 90.5. We think that gives us a chance for the carry out. Uh, with our demand that we go up to 2.3, 2.4 billion versus 1.8 billion now. So, you know, we think that you do have to be pretty aggressive uh, on new crop sales. If you're concerned as we get between $3.90 and $4 on new crop corn, buy some insurance before the start of the, uh, uh, the, pro the uh, growing season with buying some call or call spreads. Okay. All right. As a way to go ahead and feel comfortable making those sales at the cash price and be covered for the upside. And I think that's what it does, Mike. It gives you a comfort zone because we're all the same. You don't want to sell uh, too early ahead of a growing season in case you get some real weather problems and none of us know what could happen. You know, the weather's certainly been strange so far. Noah's saying we're not going to have any real uh, change in the El Nino part pattern to a La Nina. So you have to anticipate we're going to have favorable growing conditions. So make some sales on the rallies between 390 and 4 is what we're saying. Okay. Well, let's talk soybeans. This, let's talk old crop soybeans first. First, that was a market I, I thought was was dead and buried, and yet here we are, over nine dollars. How aggressive are you at making old crop bean sales right in at these levels? Well, exactly, Mike, and you're right. You know, and that's what keeps the producer from being too aggressive on sales when you get these surprise moves. We've had a you know a sharply higher move right in the gut shot of uh, harvest in South America, but uh, you know Brazil probably right now is over 65% uh, harvested. They probably sold 70% of their beans. Argentina's harvest is uh, aggressive. Yields look big there. It looks like the crop's underestimated from what the government is saying. 
But, I, you know, when you look at May uh, soybeans, we're overbought now. Funds are sitting with a big, long position, record long position in soy oil. So we, uh, we think between 910 and 920 are catch-up sales opportunities on old crop. And we think as you uh, get up into the 920, 930 on new crop beans, those are catch-up sales opportunities. Ahead of the acres and stocks report, which is going to be our first uh, chance to uh, solidify where we're at for next year. What are your estimates as we look ahead to acreage and stocks? Well, we think that the, uh, the soybean acres are going to be up a million. We think what that does for ending stocks is we think that gives us a chance for our carryout to be up close to 600 million next year if we get a big, uh, big yield on the crop. And, and also this year we're probably overstated, so probably carry outs closer to 500 million. So a lot of beans around here, a lot of world supplies. Now, we've had a lot of unrest in Brazil and the political situation with corruption charges and a potential uh, resignation or impeachment of their president. Is that going to lend us any strength here in the near term in uh, soybeans? Well, I think that's actually partly what's given us some strength because uh, what's happened is the real has uh, come back down uh, a little bit. Uh, remember when the real is really uh, high versus the dollar, it gives them the uh, export advantage. So pulling back gives them less of an export advantage. And actually, if you look at it, you go home uh, at the end of the week and the uh, U.S. soybeans are right now about uh, seven to eight cents cheaper at the Gulf than Brazil soybeans. So uh, that's an interesting fact. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, our bean market pushed up. The Chinese buying program, although, is coming to an end here in the U.S. Oh, okay. All right. So that's coming to an end here. How soon? Well, we think right now, I mean, you know, our export sales are, uh, you know, ebbing to a, a very slow pace um, right at the time when Brazil, uh, you know, is picking up the pace. But the real certainly has given us a one last shot on demand. Okay. Well, let's talk livestock market. So we saw the uh, Live cattle futures down almost four dollars on the week. Where was cash trade this week, Don? Are you from? Do you know? Yeah, you know the cash trade this week was uh, lower. Uh, you know, basically at one thirty-six, uh, two to three dollars lower uh, on the week. But I think the the trade thought we actually could be trading at one forty. And really, what happened to the cattle market, Mike, is we had some just very good weather early. It was an early growing season. I think we put our seasonal top in the cattle two to three weeks earlier than normal. Then we got into the weather that's turned not so favorable for grilling. Our uh, demand has kind of suffered again. Our box beef came under pressure. So, um, you know, this week we were down for, uh, you know, four, four day, or five days straight, and then we bounced at the end of the week a bit. But, uh, you know, uh, pressure, I think, in an early seasonal top. You know, looking at the deferred months of this live cattle contract, there is substantial discounts built into this future spread. Where do you, how should producers be managing that discount looking out? Yeah, you, are you pricing aggressively out through the end of summer? Yeah, and I think what you're talking about is the discounts, you know, probably up front. But if you look into August of 17, we're, uh, there, it's on the board, no real trade, but it's under 110. So it just tells us that the cattle market is in a multi-year bear market. But I think where we're at is probably a seasonal, uh, typical seasonal market. We probably put our seasonal top in here around the 140 on cash cattle. You probably put a seasonal low in somewhere in June, uh, middle of June. And it's probably going to be somewhere around that 120 on cash if I had to take a, a, a guess at it. Um, then we probably try and rally back a little bit. But these uh, placement figures are going to be a real issue, up 10% in February. We think March are up 15%. So rallies are catch-up sales opportunities with a lot of meat coming at us. Overall, uh, beef production probably up 2 to 3%, um, along with the other pork and poultry competition. Okay. Now, feeder cattle have seen a big break here over the last two weeks. It was accelerated by that cattle on feed report last Friday. Are we coming to the end of this break, or is there still more downside here in the nearby feeders? Well, you know, you look at the placement figures that we've had, they've been big, and they've been big just because we have a lot of feeders outside the feedlot, a lot of feeders coming off of the wheat pasture right now. And um, I think where we're at in the feeder cattle is we think it's one that probably is the best of the worst in the cattle that probably has uh, some support. But I would say, you know, another 3 to $5 down, you know, we'd probably see some buying interest. But the upside rallies, just as the cattle uh, cash, uh, cattle in the uh, futures, we think are probably more risk management opportunities than anything else. Because remember, November feeders uh, took a shot down uh, under 140. Under 140. Now, as a, as a multi-year bear, here we're into this cycle. What's the downside risk in your mind today over the next three years in feeder cattle? Well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at it, we probably have uh, from probably closer to the 115 to 120. 
uh, maybe 125. I think that's a downside target. Same thing in the cash cattle, probably a downside target realistically, probably around 100 to 105. Okay. And we could go under that. I mean, if this competition picks up cash cattle, uh, you know, you don't want to hear it, but probably, uh, you know, could trade between 95 and 100. Now, you talk about competition. We've heard a lot of stories in the last week to 10 days about expanded processing capacity in the hog market coming online in the next year to year and a half. Lean hogs uh, down at almost $2 on the week. Where do you see this lean hog market going in the near term? Well, in the near term, I think, you know, you have to look at the supplies that we had ahead of us, and we don't see a shortage of supplies. We think we probably have a seasonal, uh, more of a seasonal type of market there also. The futures market probably got ahead of ourselves, you know, pushed the June hogs up around 84. But we think that probably the real risk on the market is into the fourth quarter. We think supplies will be up 4%. We uh, Somewhere in that area, 35 to 4%. So we think that, we believe what the government said in their outlook meeting, that they think that we could be trading for the next year around 57 for an average price in the dress. So. Um, we don't have any any uh, prices on the board that are down to that level, so it just tells you risk management probably makes sense if you want to kind of believe a little bit what the government is focused on, and I think that's the case. With that being the case, how far out are you making sales for your hog producers? Well, I think you go out as far as you can. As aggressively, you can go out with options as far as February. You can go out in the futures even farther than that. But if you look at June and July of uh, 17, um, you know they're sitting around 76. And, you know, that's not a bad price from a break-even standpoint if the inputs stay at these levels. Right. It looks a little better than 57. Most okay. definitely. All right. Don, thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But Don and I will keep the market discussion going and answer more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available on our website. While you're there, check out the Market to Market Classroom. It's a place where students of all ages can find stories on the business, technology, and science of agriculture. And join us again next week when we'll dive into the details of the 2016 Prospective Plantings Report with a special roundtable edition of the program. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.